all over our cities, along our coastlines and across our green and pleasant land, an invisible army is fighting a never-ending war. Their enemy is the filth that we create and the vermin that thrive on it. Welcome to the hidden world of the Grime Fighters. On Grime Fighters tonight, pest controller Pete is on the trail of bedbugs. They don't actually bite you, they inject you. Sewer man Bill reflects on dinner. Looks like the stew I had last night. Didn't have so many lumps in it though. And restaurant inspector Johnny enjoys the delights of just another regular shift. Unfortunately, you just missed a rat run across the uh, run across the ground. In Dagenham, East London, Pete the Pest Controller's war on the borough's unwelcome guests continues. This morning, he's been called back for the fourth time to a flat where the family are suffering from an infestation of bedbugs, one of the most difficult insects to eradicate, but this time he's up the ante with some serious insecticide. Well, we've got another exciting day, as usual. Uh, we've been here before on this one. The stuff I was using before didn't seem to like knock them out. They sort of like got a resistance against it. And so I've had to go over to a new stuff, which I'm using Ficam W, which is Bendio Carb. Hopefully this stuff will knock them right out and they should have a good night's sleep. Bed bugs don't only live in beds, they inhabit skirting boards and cracks and crevices in the bedroom, so Pete has to diligently search every part of the kid's room. They feed on your blood and detect heat from your body as you sleep. They're also attracted to the carbon dioxide a person breathes or snores out in the night. Once they've located you asleep and obviously very still so an easy target, they'll suck their fill of blood from you. The state of the children's mattress is a terrible indication as to how bad the problem in this bedroom really is. These are blood spots. Well, see, the children have been sleeping on the bed, been bit, and the blood's just come out before it's actually congealed on the person or the host. They can also be on animals. They can actually get on cats and dogs as well and take blood from them as well. So this is sort of like a prime area to start looking for when you've got evidence on the mattress. Bed bugs are tiny, the biggest being around five millimetres long, and when they're not filled with blood, they're opaque in colour, making them even more difficult to locate. So Pete's investigations will have to be meticulous. Across the borough, Simon and Bill, one of Barking and Dagenham's sewage clean-up teams, are facing their first challenge of the day. With Simon's regular partner, the old master Terry, still off poorly, Simon continues to be lumbered with Bill, now complete with his huge machine. The sewer van's in the service and we've got the big beast out, which is my baby, uh -huh. that I use during the day. Which you sit on this side of the baby, No, oh, no, no I've no, got no. the steering wheel this side. He's the, la <laughs> he's the lazy one, he sits in the driver's seat all the time, he don't get out. A lady at number six has reported a block lavatory, but the sewer run where the boys reckon the blockage is goes through next door's back garden, so better wake up the neighbour. Hello, Barking and Dagenham sewer team. Got someone there? Or are you just talking to yourself? Well, <laughs> after gaining entry, Bill does the usual disappearing trick, but Simon's used to it after working with Terry. I've got another Terry Lee there, he just wanders off, you don't know where he's going. <laughs> Bill, how about the food? I'll be chow. Let me out. You got a cover there, Bill? Yeah. Have you pulled it? No, I'm going to pull it now. Well, can you open the gate? I meant, I meant the cover. So now they've found each other, time to get the cover up. And lift. And as you can see, it is full. It looks like the stew I had last night. Didn't have so many lumps in it though. You can tell them people are not eating enough rubbish. It is blocked. We need further investigations on this. The boys need to now look for the interceptor where all the sewers in the run meet. For once, it's easy to find, just outside in the yard. Right, you're going to talk jargon now, aren't you? Yes. I'm going to go and stand over here. Anyway. No, you can stand here. Come stand here, because I might be alone. Yeah. Can I slap him? No, you can't. Why not? No violence in the council. At least I can grow here, look. Come right, on. This is the interceptor that goes out into the main. And what we can do is lift up to see if this is blocked. If this is blocked, this is where we got to do it from. Oh. As you can see, it's full and it's got extra big lumps in it. Same problem again, no fibre in the diet. With the interceptor blocked, Simon needs to get some tools from the truck, unfortunately leaving Bill on his own. While you're gone, I'm going to get a straw and suck some of that out. Mm. 
It's early evening in a rain-soaked Wolverhampton, and for restaurant inspectors John and Faye, it's the start of another evening's shift, keeping a watchful eye on some of the city's 500 eateries. On their roster tonight is a local Indian takeaway due for a routine inspection. It's often quite good to have a look at the menu, just so you sort of familiarise yourself with the types of food they're doing, um, so that allows you to ask perhaps the appropriate questions, and if there's anything slightly unusual, you can sort of question them about that uh, if you need to. After getting togged up, first John always seeks out a basin to wash his hands. We're, we're trying to encourage businesses to sort of follow good hygiene practices, so it's really good if businesses are seeing, you know, we've come in, before we do anything, we wash our hands. You know, it's just sort of encouraging them to do the same, really. Uh, also, it gives you a great opportunity to make sure they've got the necessary hand washing facilities available. Another thing you can do when you go to wash your hands is actually check that the basin has been used, i.e. is it bone dry? Sometimes you walk into a premises, you go to wash your hands, they've been preparing food for a couple of hours and the sink's bone dry. This one was wet. OK, I think I've just broke your, your hand dry. Slightly embarrassed about his rough treatment of their towel dispenser, John heads outside to inspect the back of the restaurant. We often come out into the sort of the, the behind the scenes bit, if you like, outside the rear door, sort of to check um, the condition of the land surrounding. Um, unfortunately, you just missed a rat run across the uh, run across the ground. Now, obviously, we don't want to see accumulations of waste. Uh, and, and things that are going to harbour rodents because if you encourage rodents into an area near a food premises you've got the risk then the additional risk of them finding their way inside. Not great with the door left open like I did see a rat now with the door left open they run the risk of the rat running straight into the food premises which is obviously com a complete no-no so one thing we will be saying is make sure that the door's kept shut. For John this inspection hasn't really got off to the best of starts. First impressions aren't, aren't, aren't particularly good. Um, obviously, we'll have to move and you know go inside and look more detail. But just walking through didn't look particularly clean. The structure looked in poor condition. Outside, we've seen a rat. We've seen accumulations of waste. I think we perhaps need to get inside and look a bit more, a bit more closely at what's happening inside. Let's hope for the owners that things are set to improve. In Dagenham, Pete, the council's pest controller, is continuing to assess the infestation of bedbugs in a children's bedroom. He's collecting as many as he can to take away and incinerate before he lets loose with his insecticide. For Pete, though, getting up close and personal with the bedbugs is what life's all about. They're quite fascinating cr uh, creatures and I'm fascinated about them. They don't actually bite you, they inject you. They, they've got like long tubes, two long tubes at the uh, front of their head and their eyes above the top. And what happens is the tubes will penetrate the skin. One of them will penetrate the skin and then they produce an anticoagulant which stops the blood clotting. And then the other tube goes in and sucks the blood out which fills the actual body cavity of them. And because they're transparent, it all fills up with blood and that's where, hence where you get the brand looking bed bug. You could actually see some of the babies uh, actually filling up with blood if they were draining the blood from a host. Bed bugs normally reside in the lower echelons of a room or in the bed itself. It's very rare to see them higher up on the walls unless there are any cracks for them to hide in. Anywhere there's lines like this, usually where the wallpaper is, you'll get the bed bug in, in amongst them. But for some reason that what they've done is they put wallpaper up but they're painted over the top, which stops the bed bug getting into it. They've not realised what they've done, but they've done a good thing by stopping the bed bug getting behind the wall. Otherwise, we'd have to spray the whole ceiling, the whole wall. What I'm doing is trying to move stuff away, because all their trouble looking at it, and from the survey back there, is they're all underneath the skirting ball. We've isolated the beds. We've got most of the bed bugs out of the beds, the ones which I can't get in in the corner, which we spray. I don't think this is going to be a problem. I, th I think we're on top of it now. So after now his fourth visit to the flat and his painstaking investigation work, Pete reckons he's eventually got a grip on what's going on. So all that's left to do now is to give the whole bedroom a good spraying with the extra strength insecticide and hopefully that should sort the problem. I think it went very well. They'll be out to sleep in that bed tonight. Once the room's dry, I'm confident. So I think it's going to work this time. Dagenham sewage team Simon and Bill have had a result clearing the blockage at number six earlier than expected. So with no more call-outs, it's time for a quick cuppa and wait for a call. 
Bill always tries to have a laugh while doing the job he loves, but for him, helping the public is what it's all about. I wouldn't like to do anything different, to be honest with you, because I love what I do. I mean, uh, four weeks ago, I got called over to Thames to do a sewer job over there. We knocked on the door, and bless her soul, the poor lady, she fell over and cut her leg. So I automatically bandaged it up for her, cleaned the wound up and that, and I took her over to the doctors. And I sat with her inside the doctors with her while she was getting like sorted out. And then afterwards, I took her back home, and then we settled her down, made her comfortable, and then when we cleared the job, done the job for her. And then she was happy with that. I hope she's all right now, bless her. So our job really is 90% calming them down and making them feel that something's going to get done. Yeah, making them sure that we ain't going to leave unless we clear the job. If it takes us a day, two days, we will still stay there and clear the job. Coming up in part two, Simon and Bill get a call out to test their dedication. Restaurant inspectors John and Faye continue their appraisal of the Indian takeaway and we're out in Leicester and Wolverhampton waging war on the fly tippers. Throughout the country, an army of professionals are continuing to dedicate their daily lives to waging war on the nation's grime. In Leicester, like all major cities, the council provides a huge range of waste recycling services. One of the biggest centres in the city for purely household waste is here at Freeman's Common. But for Steve and Sarah, who patrol the facility, busting people who are dumping trade waste is the major issue. As far as they're concerned, this is fly tipping, so getting caught could result in a £50,000 fine or five years in prison. The problem is actually working out who's legit. As far as Steve and Sarah are concerned, this red van looks a little suspicious, especially as it's been here once before this morning. Have you got another van load, sir? Yes, sir. Have you recently moved, sir? Uh, I've just lost my mother-in-law. Oh, and, I'm uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, so... And you're clearing out the house? Yes. I mean, we're bound to have suspicions. Second time today that van's been in, it's fully loaded. Um, for a house clearance, it's, it's a big house. We'll uh, check on the vehicle reg and uh, follow it up. With the registration, Steve can make further inquiries as to the nature of the registered keeper's business or even request surveillance. He also then knows where the vehicle lives, which in this case, with a guy unloading a huge amount of glass, could be a real help. The gentleman uh, told us that um, it's from a replacement conservatory he's had built at home. So what we'll do, we'll make a discreet inquiry and see if he's got a new conservatory. If not, then he's been telling us something that's not right and we'll, follow, we'll have him in. But for Steve and Sarah, on further investigation, these alleged dodgy dumpers were all legitimate. But with some hundred cars and vans arriving at the centre every day, there's every potential for success. In Wolverhampton, restaurant inspectors John and Faye are continuing their inspection of a local takeaway. Within five minutes of arriving, John has already seen a rat at the back of the premises and the general state of the restaurant hasn't impressed. Let's just hope a closer look at the kitchen proves more to his liking, but measuring the temperatures in the fridge and the state of its appearance isn't a good start. There's a slight problem with the temperature control in the fridge. Some of the foods are a, high, a temperature higher than they should be. Uh, it's not helped by the fact that these strips are perished. Uh, as well as being perished, um, as you can see, they're also mouldy and, and really quite dirty in places. So obviously cleaning of this particular piece of equipment isn't up to scratch. Next, Faye's a little concerned about the microwave. Well, it's looking to be quite damaged um, and it's like peeling off, so debris and dirt has gone down the back of it, so it could start affecting the way the microwave works. For John, the building itself could also do with a bit of attention. We've got some missing tiles here, obviously expo exposed some uh, bare plaster. I can see where sort of food splat has occurred. So we'd therefore be looking for those tiles or, or a repair job to be done there to make sure that that is easy to clean. Also, when you've got a situation like that, you could have sort of physical contamination getting into people's food, lumps of tile, plaster, paint, etc. So there's problems aplenty, but nothing so far that could be deemed as serious. Next up, though, will be the cooking areas. <laughs> 
In Dagenham, sewer team Simon and Bill have been called away from their tea break after a woman has reported a blocked drain. But after having a rummage around in the outlet in her back garden, there's already a problem. They can't seem to get access to the drain. So undeterred, the boys try a different tack and pull up the next door neighbour's cover. A bit of old-fashioned detective work might hopefully prove that the blockage is actually not in the lady's garden at all. It's an old school way. What we do is you mark off the rod here, like where my hand is, and you follow it through like that, and it's lower, and it shows you which way the trap is running to. So it looks like it comes, that lady there is probably the beginning of the run, and follow it all the way round, turns into here, and goes straight into the, the fr lady's front garden over there. So if Bill's right, the sewer should be blocked at the front of the neighbour's house, and there's no need to pester the lady anymore. Oh, I told ya, I'm good, I'm good. With a poke about in the revolting soup, Bill has his suspicions of what's causing the blockage. At the top there, you can see the floating bits are white. That's a sign of soap powder. You just bang it and it go. But obviously it's plain hard to get, you know what I mean? Just like a woman. You can never understand a woman, mate. You can understand a sewer any day of the week. In a nightmare, you can't even work them out, can you? Well, I can't anyway, might be because I'm thick. Bill may not be Casanova, but he's not only found the blockage, he also knows what's causing it. So now it's time to put the final part of his plan in place. So what we do now, we'll send a jet up from this side out into the main and unblock it from that end. So Bill needs to tog up in his banana suit and give the jet a go and see if it's all going to come together. <laughs> At the Indian Takeaway in Wolverhampton, restaurant inspectors John and Faye are wrapping up their surprise routine inspection. All John's got to do is check out the cooking area. The cleaning in the sort of the areas you can see isn't too bad. It's the more hidden areas, you know, beneath equipment, behind equipment, and the more inaccessible areas. That's where cleaning uh, is particularly bad. The sort of thing we're looking at here has been here longer than a couple of days probably a couple of weeks, maybe as long as a month, that sort of level. So the restaurant's had its fair share of problems with too much food being left out at room temperature, the overall condition of the building itself and the need for a really thorough deep clean. But it's the good food handling practices that they've seen in the kitchen that's impressed John and Faye. We often think that the most critical part is the handling practices, although the place perhaps needed a bit of structural improvement and some improved cleaning, the fact that they're handling the food in a safe manner does give us some confidence and we can sort of walk away thinking, yeah, people are safe to eat the food that's produced there. In Dagenham, East London, Simon and Bill have sparked up the high-pressure jetter to give the sewer blocked with soap powder a good flushing. That is the soap powder, that's why I dragged out the interceptor, what you can see there. And now I'm going to turn it up a bit more to try and go up into the interceptor, out into the flow. With the jetter now at its maximum pressure, this is potentially a very dangerous procedure. And so I'm on the back of here when he's at the end of the jet, nothing gets between me and him. I'm responsible for him once he's at the end of the jet. When this gauge goes up to 3,000 psi, he can take his head off. The huge pressure of the jetter soon easily frees the blockage. Another successful job done, and for once, Bill's being nice to Simon. Him, I trust him with my life. And it's God's truth. You have to, when you're doing this sort of work and the pressure that kicks out, you've got to have someone you really trust. Not just for your sake, it's for the member of the public. But Bill's affections can often get the better of him. Have a cuddle with that. Come here, come here. Have a cuddle. Give me a cuddle. <laughs> get, get. <laughs> At the Household Waste Recycling Centre in Leicester, Steve and Sarah are still on the lookout for people dumping trade waste illegally at the site to avoid paying for its disposal. This rather large van, unloading a huge amount of cardboard, has immediately raised the alarm. Well, I'm just watching him for the moment because we'll wait for him to actually unload something and see what he does. So we'll walk over to the ladies. On the side of the van, it states that it's a catering services business and we've got these look like boxes that have carried yeah, some these sort are of only food boxes stuff, at the top. perhaps from a catering business. The boxes are only at the top. It's all the kitchen units at the bottom. Okay, okay let's, have, let's get to that and have a look what you've got then. Under closer inspection of the contents of the van, Steve and Sarah are pretty sure that in all probability this is a van load of trade waste and they've voiced their opinions. We've told him that we don't believe what's on there is domestic. If he wants to drop it off here, 
Um, we will take the line that he would appear to have been committing an offence and we'll deal with that. But there's no need for Steve to worry because the guy agrees to dump the cardboard at the commercial site. <laughs> Illegal dumping of rubbish and fly tipping is the scourge of our inner cities. In Wolverhampton, John, one of the council's enforcement officers, makes it his daily duty to relentlessly pursue the perpetrators. But without the undying support from the local community, his job often seems futile. Nobody wants to get involved. Nobody wants to report them. You need the help of the public. They've got to report it and, uh, and help the community. On roads like this, that are repeatedly targeted by the fly tippers, John tries to combat the problem by deploying some of the latest technology. This bit of road here, because it is isolated, it is, uh, it is a hot spot. Nobody's going to see anything, so uh, there's a um, place down there which windows that overlook this stretch of road. I'll arrange to get a camera put into one of the windows there and uh, hopefully we'll pick uh, the vehicles up to uh, dump the waste and uh, take it from there. That evening, John gets access to the building to set his trap. This is um, a, similar to a DVD recorder that uh, you've got at home and it, uh, it's got a hard drive in it. We, we're now sort of going to attach a colour camera to the hard drive and it will record on there the movements outside, hopefully picking up the fly tippers. It's going to sit on a box on a ledge up there. Uh, looking out over the road. Many may argue that this is a waste of resources, but illegal fly tipping costs the council a fortune. It's, it's worth it's worth putting in to try and catch the fly tippers, uh, because it costs Wolverhampton Council uh, three four hundred thousand pound a year. Uh, so it is worth it. With the camera set, it's now a waiting game, but John doesn't have to wait long. That night a transit van arrives and next morning the evidence of its visit is clear to see. With the fly tipper's van caught on camera, John's now got some solid evidence to work with. Further investigations are ongoing, which John hopes will lead at last to a prosecution. Since the filming of the show, Johnny and Faye have popped back to the restaurant and they're delighted that some real improvements to the working environment have been made. And John has gone ahead with prosecuting the fly tippers caught 